We're going to be turning to James chapter 1, verse 2. And this portion of scripture is a really important portion of scripture for me because I came across it. And it's not that I didn't read it before, but when you go through a tough time and you go through a difficulty, you need something to stand on. That means that you need a thought to stand on, a promise to stand on. And this, this scripture, I'll explain it, I'll, I'll read it in a second, but it, it really spoke to me when my daughter, Abriana, which is sitting on the front, front, front row over here with my, our little grandson, when she was three years old, she came down with cancer and it was unexpected. She got really sick and, and she started losing weight and she started losing energy. We didn't know really initially what it was. We finally took her to Loma Linda Hospital and they told us, we regret to inform you, your daughter has leukemia. And in that, in that period of time, my response was really gonna be important because it was gonna turn, determine my train of thought. That means one thought leads to another thought, leads to another thought. So you have to be careful that when you get bad news or you run into difficulties, you got to be careful what you allow to come out of your mouth. And you have to be careful how you respond. Because you respond, your response can cause emotional breakdowns or it could cause a trigger, trigger a breakthrough. It could cause, a, it could cause you to get really sad or it could trigger hope, your response. And you can't always control what happens to you, but you can control your response. So we need to be skilled in battle. What I mean by that is, is life is, life has trials. Life will come with difficulties and there's all kinds of problems. There's relationship problems. There's health problems. There's financial problems. There's parenting problems with your kids. There, if you have a business, you have, you have, you'll have career problems or business problems, ministry problems. Life does have problems and trouble. It doesn't mean your life needs to be full of trouble, but you will have trouble. But trouble and trials are defining moments. Say with me, they're what? Defining moments. So you need to learn how to define your moments. And, and I, I read this scripture and I memorized it in the New King James Version. And it, it was something like this. We're going to read it in the NLT. But I have it in my heart because when I was going through this, it was my response. This scripture was my response. And, and I want you to get to the place where emotions aren't your response. People aren't your response. But the word of God is your response. And this is what I did. I, I, I got this scripture in my heart. And, I, and it was in my heart because it started coming out of my mouth. And this is, what I, this is what the scripture says in the New King James Version. It says, count it joy when you fall into diverse trials and tribulations. Knowing that the testing of your faith will produce patience. But let patience or endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. And this scripture we're going to read right now in the, we're going to read it in the NLT version. And this scripture is going to equip you on how to deal with every single type of challenge you'll ever face in life. If you learn the skill of response, the proper response, this is what's going to happen. There will not be a challenge that will ever overcome you. You will always be in the winning column. How many want to get some wins in their lives? So let's look at James chapter 1, verse 2. And this is what I want to do. I'm going to read verse 1, and I want you to read verse 3, and I'll read verse 4. Verse 1, I mean, James chapter 1, verse 2, I'm sorry, says this. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. Verse 3, please. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. All this scripture is saying that this trial and this trouble is taking you on a journey of personal development. 
spiritual development. It didn't say at the end, it would end in defeat. It would end in a tragedy. It would end in completeness. It would end in perfection. It would end in a place that you don't need nothing. What he's saying, at the end of this trial, at the end of this trouble, the end result will be, you'll be better than you ever were. You'll be complete in your character. Your morals will develop. Your character will develop. Your wisdom will develop. Your spiritual life will develop. You'll become stronger. This trial is not meant to defeat you. This trial is meant to develop you. And we're talking about perspective because your perspective will determine your emotions, your thoughts, your outcomes. That means that right now, whatever trial you're in, we need to learn how to respond properly so we can start getting scriptural results, not demonic results. Every trial you're in is a test of your faith. It's not a test of your knowledge of society. It's not a test on how much money is in your bank account. It's not a test on how much education you have and your degrees. It's a test of your faith. That's what this is all about. So now how do we respond? And I'm going to give you two quick responses and then we'll go deeper into this portion of scripture. It says this, the scripture says, dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind comes your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. The first response is expect trouble. Say it with me. You should not be surprised that life has trouble in it. You should expect it. You should prepare for it. You should be ready for it. You cannot win any battles that you're not ready for. Do you know why some people are defeated? And this is why they're defeated. They think once you become a Christian, there are no battles. Jesus did not come to save you from battles. He came to make you I want you to, he came to make you strong so you can finally say this. I've been losing before I came to Christ. The drugs were beating me. Emotionally, I was destroyed. I felt rejected. I was abused. I was in a cycle of destruction. I was a liar. I was a cheat. I couldn't break the cycle. I was full of lust. I was trying to change. I couldn't change. Then finally, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and he set me free from the repercussions of an attack of the enemy before I was born. I was rejected, but now I found out that there's a Jesus that can set me free, that can heal my broken heart that loves me that cares about me that died for me rose again from the dead and I accepted him as the Lord and Savior and now I can say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me he didn't came he didn't come to help me just survive he came to help me conquer I just don't conquer you just don't conquer Conquering's my identity now. And I cannot conquer if I'm not facing some trouble, difficulties, problems. I want greater victories. I want to advance. I want to do more. I want to take over more territory. I want to reach more cities. I want to see more people get saved. I want to make more disciples of Jesus Christ. That only happens if I learn how to fight. There's no new territory unless there's some trouble, some challenges, some battles. Come on. There's no advancement and don't break through unless I'm some resistance. Say with me, I'm ready for resistance. Look what the Bible says about this. First Peter 4.12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. 
as if something strange were happening to you? Have you ever gone through a difficult time and you say, why me? And the scripture saying, you don't need to say that because we all go through it. And just because you're going through something doesn't mean that God's not there. This is a time for your faith to be tested. Anyone could say they have faith with no trouble. We only know how strong our faith is when we're facing some resistance. It's easy to love everybody when everybody's nice. Your love is not tested when everybody's giving you cupcakes for your birthday. Your love is being tested when people are rude and inconsiderate and they turn their backs on you and they stab you in the back and, and they're ridiculing you. And, and God says, now love your enemies. Now we're going to find out if you have real God love. The scripture says that even our love is supposed to surpass a slap in the face. That they would slap you on one cheek and you turn the other cheek like slap this one now. Now that's some real love test right there. But Jesus went through it all. Now our faith needs to be tested. And when we're talking about our faith, we're talking about our faith in Christ. Our faith in the word. Our faith in his promises. Anyone can shout when things are great. But can you shout when things turn sour? Can you praise God and show up to the house of God and serve God when it looks like every single person has turned their backs on you? And if it's that case that you think everybody's turned their back on you, it's not true. God's not turned his back on you. And he says, if I'm for you, who can be against you? So expect trouble. It's part of life. If you want a business, it's part of it. If you want to go to school, there's going to be some trouble and tests. And you cannot graduate from a university without taking a few tests. I want to, you want marriage? You're, to, you're signing up for marriage trouble. I want to be married. How come you want to be married now? And then when you get married, you don't want to be married. You know why? You ran into marriage trouble. See, everybody wants a business, but they don't want problems. But pro bi bis great business owners solve problems. Everybody wants children, but they want children that are good all the time. There's no such thing. Soon as you have a child, you got trouble. <laughs> Parents in trouble. Everything worthwhile comes with trouble. You want to be a good football player. You're going to have some resistance on that field. There are going to be people trying to tackle you for every inch that you're trying to gain ground. Life is a lot of times like football. Life's a lot of times like basketball. It's not just shooting in the playground. There's a six foot seven guy trying to block you, pack you, embarrass you, dunk on you. It is life. And if we don't learn how to fight and expect trouble and expect battles, we'll be overcome by surprise. So say with me, expect it. He, says, he said, dear brothers and sisters, when? He didn't say if trouble comes your way, but when trouble comes your way. And he said, brothers and sisters, you know what he said? He's talking about all of us. The second response, according to the scripture, is choose joy. Say it with me, choose joy. Consider an opportunity for great joy. Like, that don't even make sense. Like, I just got bad news from the doctor. Uh, um, I just feel like everybody turned on me. I, I'm going through some difficulties right now. I just got arrested for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm in prison. What's up? Joy. Count it joy. Because th do you know this? You're going to go through a trial one way or the other with a good attitude or bad attitude. Why not have a, at least a good attitude? Now, why is your response so important? 
Because you could have a fleshy response, a negative response, or you could have a godly response. Now, if I respond with joy, and we're going to explain why you should respond in joy with it in a minute. But if I respond with joy, this is what I'm responding. I'm responding in faith that I know right now it don't look good. But you know why I still got a smile on my face? Do you know why I still got a praise on my tongue? Do you know why I still go to the house of God? Because I'm not looking at what I see right now with my physical eyes. I'm not focusing on what they said or she said. I'm not focusing on what the doctor said. I'm focusing on what God's word says. And God's word says this is going to end with promotion, with growth, with victory. So why should I be tripping if I know it's going to end great? So how can you still be smiling? Because I know how it ends. I don't know how it's going to get there, but that's not my business. My business is just to make sure I keep my joy. Someone say joy. Joy. Praise, gladness, celebration. And I know I'm not silly to think that everybody's here is living their best life now. There's people who have financial problems here today. You got marriage problems. You've lost a loved one. You got health problems. Your heart is broken. But don't you let it overcome you. Don't, don't, don't leave this place with the wrong mindset. Choose joy. Choose hope. Choose to meditate on God's word. Joy, a joy response gives no room for a wrong response. What I mean by that is if I'm responding with joy, I can't be responding with fear, anger, blame, depression, anxiety, or doubt. I'm asking a simple question. If you're in a trial right now, what emotion is overwhelming you? Is it depression? Is it hopelessness? Do you know that you could be a Christian for years and not know how to fight spiritually? You could be dealing with a spirit of suicide. You know how spirits of suicide developed? They, they develop with thoughts of doubt, not joy. I've never met anybody that's contemplating suicide that's full of joy. I'm so happy I could kill myself. <laughs> I'm so depressed I could kill myself. I'm so hopeless I could kill myself. So when the Bible is telling us to count it as an opportunity to praise God, your trials, your difficulties, your trouble is an opportunity to praise God. It's an opportunity to shine your light. It's an t- opportunity to share, um, to, to cheer. Why are you cheering? You're not cheering because your team is behind. You're cheering because right now you want to change the atmosphere. And right now you are taking ownership of the moment and you're defining the moment. This will not end in suicide. This will not end in defeat. This will not end in depression. This will not end in a loss. This is going to end in victory. This is going to end with hope. This is going to end with, a, with growth. This is going to end on a high note. I don't care how it looks right now. I got joy because I know how it's going to end. That's the truth. A joy response is our default response to all trouble. Some say all trouble. Philippians 4, 4 says this, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. So when I got the report that my daughter had cancer and they brought us in that little room, Lisa began to cry. And the Holy Spirit brought me this scripture. He said, count it joy. 
Look at it as an opportunity for celebration. And I told Lisa, I go, Lisa, I know what I'm ready to say sounds crazy. It might even sound insensitive. I know we just got the report that our daughter has leukemia. But I told us I'm excited to see what God's going to do. And the reason I told her that is that we're in a battle we've been prepared for. We've been talking it. Now it's time to walk it. We got faith in God. Now it's time for us to, and we got faith in Christ. And now it's time to walk this out. The devil wants you defeated emotionally. And you become defeated emotionally when you were defeated in your thought first. No matter what I face, my standard default response will be joy. Look at Philippians 4.4. 4. It says, always be full of joy in the Lord. What? I say it again, rejoice. Now, why do you think he says it twice? Because we're hardheads. Because when I read this, always be full of joy in the Lord, I, I, I'm hearing, come again? Like what? Like that don't leave room for my depression. And you know I got depression. How, well, how do you know? The doctors told me I got it. That's how I qualify for the weed. Was that a real doctor? I don't know. It's the guy that was selling the weed back off, the guy in the back. <laughs> That's how I know. Right? And also, I, I have some anxiety issues. Because when I went to the doctor, the psychiatrist, they told me they know exactly what's wrong with me. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a chemistry thing. And they told me I got anxiety. So, I got, I, so when it says always be full of joy in the Lord, that can't happen because I've already been diagnosed too late for that scripture. And all I'm saying, are you right or is the doctor's right or is the scripture right? And I'm not saying that they didn't diagnose it, but God is bigger than all your diagnoses is. Our God, his name is above every name. His name, come on, he's above your family name. I know we're all like that. We're all drunks. We're all gangbangers. But God's name is above every single name. Come on, let's worship God that if he's saying this joy is found in the Lord. Where's the joy found in what? This is, could I ask you this question? Who took your joy away? Number two, what took your joy away? Who did you give authority to rip you off of your inheritance? Well, it was her, you know, when she left me, she took my joy with her. No, she didn't take, she didn't take. This is what she did. She left, and your problem was your joy was in Samantha. It didn't say always be full of the joy in Samantha. But it said this. What if your job got taken away? Always be full of joy in your job. Do you know why we lose our joy? Our joy is not in the Lord. Our joy is in people. Our joy is in things. And if your joy is attached to a person or thing and it's not the Lord, your emotions are going to be up and down, depending like the ocean coming in and out, depending when a job comes in, I'm good. When the job goes out, I'm not good. When Samantha loves me, I'm good. When Samantha don't love me, I'm bad. All right, are, we, are you guys still here with me? Yes, 
must be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. I say it again. What? Now, why? Why should we rejoice? Why should we respond with joy? This is what it says in James 1, 3. For you know, say no, that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. This is why even though we're in a test and we're a trial, we can respond with joy because Number one, we are being tested on what we know. Someone say, you know. The word no means what you've learned. We are not being tested on what we don't know. What we're tested, we're being tested on what we've learned. We're not being tested on what we see, on what others are saying, or what the doctor said. We're being tested on what we know, what we've been taught, what we've learned. Now, I used to love teachers that used to let you take a test with open books and notes. How many like those teachers? I used to love the teachers that used to give me the questions before the test. Have you ever had a teacher that gave you the question before the test? And then they let you bring notes in on top of it. You know what they're saying is, I'm not testing you on what you don't know. I'm testing you on what we covered. Every single answer is in what I already taught you. Okay. This is what it's saying. That every test that you're in, you're not being tested on what I know. You're being tested on what you know. The test that you're in is at your level. That means... When God allows you to be tested or troubled to come your way, what he's saying is, I prepared you for this one. Refer to your notes. Refer to the preaching. Refer to the word. Refer to your devotion time. I already gave you the answer for every one of the problems that you're facing. Not to be defeated so you can pass the test. Say it with me. I'm prepared for this test. I got all the answers. You will not be tested on what I know. You'll be tested on what you know. And the more you know, the more challenging the tests come, but the greater rewards also come with it. I want bigger tests because I want bigger results. Come on, give God some praise. I, I, I'm going to ace this one. Say it with me. I'm going to ace this one. Now, you're being tested. What's being tested? Your faith or your knowledge of God or your trust in God, your faith in Christ. That's what's being tested right now. Nothing else. How you pass a test, a spiritual test, is through confession. Say it with me, confession. You need to be careful that if you're in a trial right now, you're confessing the wrong things. What I mean by that is, could it be that you're in a spiritual fight and you're talking about people? Can you believe her? I can't stand her. She has such a bad attitude. Oh my gosh. You see how she grows dressed on Sunday? Like so unholy. I mean, she... what do you think? She goes, I don't like her either. It's just something about her just gets on my nerves. You too, me too. Did you hear what she said? Like, oh my gosh. How are you going to win a battle talking about people? You're going to win a battle talking about promises. If you don't get the word of God in your mouth, you're showing up to a faith fight with no faith. You don't show up to a gunfight without a gun. You don't show up to a knife fight without a knife. Why would you show up to a faith fight without any faith? It's not faith in faith. It's faith in the word. It's faith in the promise of God. It's faith in Jesus Christ. When it seems like it's out of control, it's not out of control. God's still in control. So I told Lisa, I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Do you know just because I said I'm excited to see what God's going to do doesn't mean that the trial stopped? So now I'm being tested on faith. So I need to continue holding on to my confession of faith. 
Before you quit, you start talking quitting. Before you get a divorce, you start talking divorce. Before you're defeated spiritually, you're defeated verbally. And it's not what others are saying that's defeating you. It's what you're saying that's defeating you. When you left me, I can't live anymore. You make me whole, complete. Without you, I'm not the same person. I feel like half of me left me. And the half that's left is broken, hurt, and damaged. If that's your reality, that'll be your emotions, that'll be your outcome, and, and this is idea. You will not overcome. You got to be saying something like this. It don't matter who's in my life, who's out of my life. long as God is in my life, I'm good. And understand, if this is not meant to work, it's not meant to work. And I don't need to force something. Okay, I, I'm good. Because my joy didn't come from you anyways. My joy came, came from the Lord. And I'm sorry if I ever put you in the place of God. I repent of that too. You know, this job, they fired me. They don't want me. But good luck, that the good rinse. There's another opportunity open up because the Lord, he's the one that supplies all of my need according to his riches and glory. This is going to work out too. I know I got a bad report. The doctors have no hope. But there's a God that resurrected from the dead and Jesus died resurrected from the dead he overcame every single challenge I'm facing I'm going back to the word of God when no one is there my God is there I'm going to get through this he's the one that's going to get me through this thing someone say confess it in Hebrews 10 13 it says let us seize and hold tightly the confessions of our hope without wavering Without what? Be careful that your conversation is not overcome by fear, doubt, worry, victimization. No one likes me. Stop it. Gossip, hate, anger. Stop it. Well, you know, no one cares about me. Well, how do you, why are you coming to that conclusion? I was sick and no one came to visit me. Who did you tell that you were sick? Why well, didn't tell nobody, but I was missing last Sunday and no one noticed. <laughs> so you're sick and you're concerned that no one visited you? You should be focused on getting healed. And if you keep acting that way, the devil will keep putting sicknesses on you. You know why he'll put sicknesses on you? Because he already knows you respond wrong. Instead of responding with joy, you respond with, no one likes me. It's getting quiet up in here. <laughs> and if no one does visit you, maybe you need some quiet time with the Lord. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? When was the last time you prayed to God and fasted? Right now your tummy hurts. You don't need no one to give you food. You need to right? fast and spend time with the Lord. <laughs> so now why should we be happy or joy? Not joy, happy. I mean, not, not happiness, joy. Why should we respond with joy? Because it's an opportunity to grow. It says, so your endurance has a chance to grow. Our endurance has a chance to grow in a trial. And now the word endurance has to do with the ability to remain under pressure, suffering, and not waver from purpose, devotion to God, obedience and loyalty. Being able to stick it out and not quit. Now, if you don't build this endurance muscle in your life, this is what you could, what's going to happen. You'll start and quit, start and quit, start and quit. And this is what happens when you start and quit. You don't have the character to get results. And everything that you want to get results with will have a process and everything you want to get results or advancement in, whether it's reaching a city or ministering to someone, discipling them, growing spiritually, is going to come with some resistance. So when you feel like quitting and you feel like you've been taken to your limits, don't quit. 
Because if you quit, this is what happens. You don't build endurance. And if you don't build endurance, you will not be able to handle greater pressure or responsibility. This is what we don't do under pressure. We don't quit under pressure. We don't go under pressure. We grow under pressure. We stick it out. We are planted in the house of God. We are planted in our marriages. We are planted, come on, in our assignments and our vision. I'm not going anywhere. There's some battles that you have to outlast. Do you know there's some demons that are just seeing if they could outlast you? Also, you have a confession of faith. Let's see how long you confess this thing. Let's put a little pressure on you. Let's see how long you could wait. Because I think, this is what the devil's saying about all of us. I think there's some quit in you. And what he's saying is no quit in me. We're going to see who outlasts who here. And this is what God is saying. Greater is he that's seen you than the thing that you're facing out there in the world. We need, someone say endurance. Someone say endurance. Every great assignment needs endurance. When we, when we were in the hospital, this is why we needed endurance. And my endurance was built really strong in the hospital. Because as soon as my daughter got cancer, she started getting worse. What I did, I went in the room and I prayed for her. I prayed for healing. But every day the doctor's report got worse. My, my wife was pregnant with my second daughter, nine months pregnant. We're going through this in a hospital. She's nine months pregnant. My wife goes into labor. One daughter has cancer. She's going into labor. But before she goes into labor, you know, labor sometimes takes a while. So I was in that room. And what I do under pressure, I start joking too much. So I just was getting on Lisa's nerves, like, stop it. You're like, stop joking so much. Everything's a joke. Does it hurt? What was the level of that one? <laughs> oh, that one's spiking. This one's coming right now. This is a big one. She goes, Marco, stop it. I go, I'll be right back. So I went to go to the cafeteria. And when I went to the cafeteria, when I came back, Lisa was no longer in labor and delivery. The baby's heart was stopping that she was ready to deliver. And now I'm, I, get, I go, where's my wife at? She goes, we have to do emergency C-section. The baby is dying. Um, it, the heart's stopping. We don't know if the baby's going to make it. So I run over to the area that they're doing the C-section. When I get there, literally the second I get there, the doors fling right open. And the little baby is on a table with all kinds of monitors on the baby. And they're just taking her to NICU. I talked to the doctor and I said, what's going on? And they said this, this baby's heart is bad. And the only way this baby is going to survive, this baby needs heart surgery tomorrow. So now I have a, ba I have a baby being born. I got another one that's in a hospital with cancer. Same hospital. And I'm walking down the aisle with my Bible. Kind of joy when you follow into verse trials and tribulations, knowing that it's testing their faith. We're to his patience and let patience have his perfect work. They can be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. This is going to perfect me. I choose joy. Somehow, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I trust in God no matter what. And, no, and this is the truth. I'm like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My God's able to deliver me. My God's able to heal me, but, but heal my daughters. But even if he doesn't, there's one thing for sure. This is a test of faith. My faith in God is not going to change because my circumstances has changed. Yes, I believe in a God that heals, but even if he doesn't, I'm still believing in Jesus. Jesus is still my Savior. Jesus is still my Lord. I thank you, Lord Jesus, because even if they die, I'll see them for eternity. Death has lost its sting. I'm prepared in every single way with the word of God. I'm protected. Right? So, I'm sitting there in the aisle doing warfare by myself. The doctor sees me. He looks she looks at my Bible, carrying my Bible. She says, 
She looked at my body. She goes, it looks like that's not working for you. Let endurance have its perfect work. You know what I told her? I go, well, it's not over yet. And I told her this. You're not going to have the last word. I'm not going to have the last word. God's going to have the last word. So we'll see how well this goes. I'm not getting offended. See, you have to be careful with the traps. I'll, it was, see, I need to continue enduring, confessing my faith. I need to make sure that my endurance was being built up so I could run a church. Because I wasn't a pastor of a church like this yet. But if I can't handle a trial, I can't handle your trials. If I can't intercede for my daughters, I can't intercede for you guys. And if I can't handle my projects, I can't handle this big project. Right now, whatever you're dealing with right now is building up your character, is building your ability to handle weight, to handle responsibility and greater pressure and greater demand. Come on, God's just preparing you for greater things. This is not a test to fail you. This is a test to prepare you. So it's being built up. And this is the last reason we should, someone say endurance, someone say endurance. endurance. I want my endurance to grow. And the last reason we should respond with joy, the end result of trouble, trials, or tribulations is maturity. The, tr the process of trouble not only builds our endurance, but it spiritually develops us it spiritually develops into full, mature believers. James 1, 4 says, so let it grow. Say it with me. So let it grow. Let it grow. Relax. Do you know I could have easily got a little cuckoo for, little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? When that doctor said, that's not working for you, I could have been like, oh, no, you didn't. I could have said, I could have just started quoting like, like all kinds of things. Like, that's the straw that broke the camel's back. It's not scripture. <laughs> I, I, could, I could have just started getting a little ghetto. Do you know where I'm from? <laughs> like, where I'm from, we kill people for less than that. <laughs> You're talking about my daughters. You need to be more sensitive. What's your name, by the way? <laughs> because I see a lawsuit here. Where's your supervisor? Because we're going to solve this right now. My daughters are dying, but I'm going to get you. Do you know some of us are minoring, majoring in minor stuff? And because you don't have a life and you have no confession, and your faith hasn't grown, all you could do is talk about stuff that don't matter. And you got distracted and you're over here when you should be over here. I just ignored that lady. I, that lady was not going to steal my faith, was steal my confession, was not going to steal, come on, not steal my breakthrough, steal my testimony, steal my growth. I, I don't even know her. I, I do know her name. I don't even know her. I know her name. But I'm not bitter towards her at all. You know what I think? I think that she didn't even know what she was saying. I think the devil took over her mouth. But he wasn't going to take over my mouth. See, the devil could take over your friend's mouth, but doesn't mean you need to start repeating what they're saying. Get some praise back in your mouth. Get some word back in your mouth. Come on, get some promises back in your mouth. Get some victories back in your mouth. Take the cussing out of your mouth. Take the criticism out of your mouth. Take the judgmentalism out of your mouth. Take the gossip out of your mouth. The end result is, of all the trouble is maturity. Someone say maturity. That means I become full grown, fully mature, mentally, moral, spirit, spiritually, and emotionally. Now, when I become spiritually mature, there's some attributes of the spiritually mature that cause me. See, when, I, when I'm full grown, I qualify. I qualify for production. I qualify for full results. You know, when my daughters are 14, they don't qualify to drive. You got to be 16 to just even begin the process. When I grew up and I became, got in my 20s and I started practicing the word of God, I started qualifying for things that I was disqualified for because of my lack of maturity when I was 13. 
There's things right now I qualify for because I've matured into it that I was disqualified for or not qualified for just a few years ago. I'm moving into my full authority and my full maturity. And a trial at the end of every trial, at the end of every difficulty, don't run from them, grow through them. Grow spiritually so you become a spiritual adult. And when you become a spiritual adult, then you can start producing. Someone say produce. Okay, now some attributes of the spiritual mature. This is, I just want to end it with this. They're stably, they're stable emotionally. You're not mature if you're always up and down. Like, I wonder who's showing up today. Do you guys have any family members like that? Like, you're like, don't know Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde's going to show up? Right? Number, and then when they act up, you go, that's just the way they are. Leave them alone. <laughs> you know basically what you're saying? They're babies. They whine. Whine. <laughs> 50-year-old whiners. <laughs> Get all angry for nothing. You know what that shows? Lack of maturity. Some of us are so immature that you're on the road and you're cussing all these strangers out. And you too, and your mama too, and your grandma, and everybody, and everybody out here, whatever city you're from, all oh, you guys go to hell. <laughs> and they're in their car listening to classical music. <laughs> you show up to mad, work all mad. You know what? Immaturity. And then you know what's crazy? You start blaming people. You made me angry. No one made you angry. You are still immature. You get anger for stupid stuff. Pastor, you should have said stupid. That offended me. Gr grow up. <laughs> Stop being so sensitive. Relax. I know with these. The attributes of the mature. They are not easily offended. If you're always getting your feelings hurt, it's because you're immature. The other day, little Xander, he's, he's, I don't know where he's at right now. He's over there. You know why he's over there? He can't behave in here. <laughs> That's right, huh? The other day he was at my house, and some cute little girl grabs a little ball he's playing with, and he goes over there, he grabs that ball from her. Ugh! He don't know how to talk yet. That's all he could do. Ugh! <laughs> and he smacks her, and he takes the ball, and he takes this to his mama. And I go, uh, Abriana, he just right now went, uh, to her. <laughs> For that ball. He needs to grow up. Right? See, he did, uh. Right? <laughs> but then she says, oh, you don't do that. And he got the ball, came back real quiet and calm, and dropped it off at her feet. And he gave her the ball. He's growing and he's learning, but he still has some uh moments. <laughs> but it's crazy that you're 25 and you're still un. <laughs> uh! That was my boyfriend. Uh! That was my position in church. Uh! <laughs> okay. Don't be easily offended. Don't be what? When you become mature, you don't get offended by nobody. You're like, I don't even notice. I'm so busy with the, what God's doing in my life, like issues I got. I don't got time to judge your issues. Right now, I got enough issues. Come on, is there anybody humble enough to realize that? There's so much stuff that needs to be mowed on my side of the lawn. I can't focus on the weeds on your side. They're full of love. They're humble. I'll even say this, they're timely. How do you know you're maturing? You start showing up early and on time. When you're immature, you don't even show up on time nowhere because you don't value your time and you don't value their time. You got quiet right in here. <laughs> when you're mature, you finish what you start. You don't quit. When you're mature, you live holy and pure lives. 
When you're mature, you don't keep records of people's wrongs. You don't keep a list of everything everybody does wrong. When you're mature, you have healthy relationships. When you're mature, you're grateful, not critical. When you're mature, you're forgiven and merciful. When you're mature, you're teachable and correctable. I, I know how mature, I know you got degrees and I know you've been in church your whole life, but until you're corrected, I don't even know how mature you are. Why are you correcting me? I'm not the only one that's doing that in this church. Why don't you correct them? And I'm sure you've been late at times too. And then you're like, are you holier than thou? Oh, here we go. You are immature. All you need to do, someone says, you know, you were late. We start at 8 o'clock. The meeting start at 8. You showed up at 8.15, 8 8.20. You kind of have a half. You've been doing that lately. And I just want to correct you. Show on time. There's some promotions coming. And you're not going to be able to qualify for those promotions if you can't even be responsible enough to show up on time. That's all. It's not personal. I know, but I'm not the only one that show, that, that show up on time. You know, Cassandra, she wasn't on time either last week. At, remember the other meeting uh, last week? And two months ago, she wasn't on time either. Because I remember she made a big fat excuse. And she really wasn't sick when she called in, just so you know. And by the time you're done, we go, okay. You just showed me one thing. You're not ready. You got some growing to do. It's not that you're disqualified. You're disqualified for promotion now because you're not mature enough for that position. Oh, Lord. They know the word. Um, the mature are not argumentative. They have integrity. They take personal responsibility for shortcomings. And they don't give up under pressure. I'm not giving up. I'm sticking this out. I'm gonna, this is what I'll tell you. I'm going to be here in San Bernardino till I die. Say, why, well, Pastor, you're going to be here till I die? Because I'm committed to the, the assignment that God has given me in your life. There's one thing for sure. You don't have to look for Pastor Marco. You can find him right here. And I'm not saying that we won't have other churches and I won't visit other churches because I'm going to go to TJ and preach over there. But I understand my home base is right here. And you got to know where your home base is at. You got to know where your home church is at. And you can't be leaving and coming and coming and going like a wind and like a leaf in the wind. You got to, I'm not a leaf, I'm a tree. And I'm going to be planted in the house of God. And come on, the way we're allowed to reach is my church home. The pastor Marco is my pastor. I, I am being discipled by, by, by Christine. And I'm moving forward. I'm discipling four or five people. I'm going through the growth track. You can find me. You know where I'm at. I am growing every single day. I'm planted and I'm flourishing every day. I'm maturing every single day so I can qualify for the full blessing and vision that God has for me. How many know God has more for you, but you got to grow up into it? Let's give God some praise. Christian, come up here and close us out. Let's, let's all stand up, please. Did anybody learn something today? Someone say, what's our response? Joy. What's our response? What's your response? Joy. There's a fight of what? Faith. It's a fight of what? It's testing your what? And when you're in a trial, what builds, what develops in a trial? Someone say endurance. At the end of the trial, what you become is mature. Someone say mature. And then when you're mature, you qualify for mature vision responsibility, assignments, and resources. I'm growing every day. And I'm not talking, I got my stuff together. What God wants to do in my life, I still need a lot of growing up to do. Constantly making adjustments in my life. The other day, God woke me up. He goes, Marco, you're spending a lot of time developing a lot of people. He goes, let's make an adjustment. You spend time with your wife but I want you to spend disciple-making time with your wife. Make sure you're investing in her, developing her, pouring into her, training her to do the things God has called her to do. You know what that's called? Correction. That's all it is. 
I go, okay. Let's make some adjustments. So now I'm aware. I'm going to spend time with Lisa like I always do, but it's going to be more focused time. And we're going to spend some of that time going over her gifts, talents, and vision that God has for her and her ministries and help her become everything that God has called her to be. Right? But I got to grow so I can help her grow. And if you approach life that way and approach a mature way, don't ever get offended out of the church. You know, Chris wasn't offended out of the church. He was promoted to Pomona campus. Start expecting promotion. Don't go. Grow. I'm going to put a t-shirt. Don't go. Grow. So I'm mad. I just, oh my God. They need to have more of the move of the spirit. I don't know what's going on. Just start making up stuff. Why don't you have more of a move of the spirit upon your own life? People are going to save, deliver, and separate. Whatever. Relax. Maybe you're supposed to start a new level move of the spirit. Hallelujah, come on. Because God will use you to be a conduit of something we need in this church. I'm like, God, so good. I love you. Where's Chris at? Oh, he's right there. Love you. We're going to dismiss in a second, but, but before we do, we're going to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as your Savior and know him. A new leader, a new trader, a new mentor. And then we're going to give you an opportunity also, if you feel like you're overwhelmed, give your problems and cares to the Lord. Let this be the day that you give up the depression, the discouragement, grab some joy from the Lord, all right? Thank you, guys. Can we get Pastor Mark? Who, who received a word from God today? Come on, by show of hands, you're saying, I'm enduring all the way to the end. I'm not going to stop for anything. I'm going to go all the way to the point of maturity. By show of hands, you're saying, that's me. I received a word today. I know I did. I believe God is speaking to us today, and maybe you're here in this room and you were invited by a friend or a family member or you found the church online somehow and you came today i want to introduce you to an i want to introduce an opportunity for you to begin a journey relationship with jesus you've heard songs being sung today you've heard pastor marco talking about jesus and who is this jesus you're wondering why everyone's so excited and hyped up in here and it's not because people came into this place perfect or they grew up in the church. It's because we came in here with bondages, with depression, with brokenness, with hurt, with pain, with shame and guilt. And we came and we heard about someone who, whose name is Jesus that came to this earth to die for our sins so he could set us free and give us a new start. That's who we want to introduce you to. You came all the way here today. Don't leave the same person. I want to encourage you to leave everything at the feet of Jesus today. Maybe you're in this room and you're saying, I want that relationship. I want to know what people have and I want to have that too. I want that joy and that peace. The Bible says that the price or the wages of our wrongdoing, of our sin is death. That means there's a price that's on our heads for the wrongs that we've done. But thank God that he sent his only son to this earth to live as a man. He lived a perfect life. And he said, step out of the way. I know you're gonna, you were supposed to pay that price. Step out of the way. I'm going to pay that price for you. I'm going to go to the cross on your behalf. Jesus paid the price for all of our sin so that we can be forgiven. Someone needed to hear that. So that we can be forgiven. God wants your sins forgiven and forgotten forever. And if you're saying you want to welcome that forgiveness, you want the free gift of eternal life and you want to welcome Jesus into your heart today then today's a day don't leave this 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 place without the opportunity without receiving the love that he's freely giving you we're not pressuring you into this moment but we are saying choose Jesus rather than depression choose Jesus rather than the bondage choose Jesus rather than the addiction choose Jesus today if you want to choose Jesus today and give your life to him or rededicate your heart to him at the count of three I want you to raise up your hand one two three all across this room hands up hands up I see your hand in the back I see your hand over here I see these two hands over here I see, anybody else you're I see your hand right here and I see your hands over there. Anybody else, you're saying, that's me. I want to receive Jesus today, or I want to rededicate my heart to Jesus today. 
Everyone that just raised your hand, I want you to make your way out of your seat. And I want you to come up, up, up here really quick. Give us the honor and the privilege of praying with you, of celebrating your life, and congratulating you today. Come on, church. Can we encourage them as they make their way forward? If you raise your hand, even way out there in the back, I want you to come all the way up. Come up here saying, that's me. I want to receive Jesus today. I want to give him my heart. And I want to restart a new relationship with him. Let's encourage them as they make their way forward. Do me a favor. Ask somebody next to you. You're saying, if you want to go up there, I'm willing to go up there with you. Maybe someone needs a little encouragement next to you. Talk to the person next to you. If you want to go up there, I'm willing to go up with you. Yes, they're still coming up. They're still coming. If there's anyone here today, you're going through the trial of your life. You're going through a battle and it's and it's getting to the point where you walked into here and you didn't know if you're going to keep going. You felt like you're ready to quit and give it all up and you know this word was for you today. If you're saying, I want to receive that endurance. I want to pray with someone and stand in the gap. I want you to make your way out of your seat. And I want you to come up here because we're going to pray with you. We're going to encourage you. You're saying, I'm going through the trial of my life. And I'm going to stand in the gap with someone. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I want you to come out of your seat. Make your way up here. And let's pray. Let's agree. Let's stand in the gap with someone today. Come on. Come on up here if that's you. I see people coming up right now. If that's you, anybody else, you're saying, I want to stand in the gap. I want to pray with someone. I'm taking a step of faith today. They're still coming up. Come on, let's top it up for them. Come on, they're still coming up. There's still more. There's still a few more coming up. Let's clap it up for our, our brothers and sisters. Thank you, Jesus. We might need a few more altar workers up here. Now, everyone who just came up here, I want you to... Just look at me for a second. If you, those, of, those of you that just came up here, the decision you're making today is going to change your life forever. This isn't just, th this right here is a moment where we're saying, I'm not going to be the same person anymore. I'm giving my whole heart to Jesus. And we're going to stand in the gap with you. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you, but they're also going to help you take your next step. Your next step is a class called Starting at the Way. Say that with me. Say Starting at the Way. And in this class, what we're going to do, we're going to show you how to walk in your faith journey. We're going to show you how to fight the battles. We're going to help you get baptized. And you're going to learn everything, all the foundations that you need for your faith. So don't leave today without praying with somebody and without uh, allowing them to help you take that next step. Come on, who's ready to pray today? We might need a few more workers up here, I think, over here in this area. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all bow our head. We need a couple more over here, too. Let's all bow our head and let's close our eyes. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I give you my whole heart. Forgive me of my sin. I know I've done wrong. So I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and for raising on the third day so that I can be set free. Set me free from the bondage, from the lies, from the depression, from suicide. Set me free. My life is yours. God, give me endurance. Give me a heart of endurance to go all the way, to not quit in the middle, but to go all the way. Thank you, Jesus. My life will never be the same. My faith is in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Church, can we give God some praise today? How many really received a word from God today? You said that word was for me. Church, we want to encourage you. Come back Wednesday at 7 p.m. We have an on-fire service. If you've never been to our Wednesday night, I want to encourage you. Come out with your friends and family. Invite somebody. These nights are on fire on Wednesdays. Be here Wednesday night. And don't forget, if you haven't signed up for Girl Track, sign up. We want to get you connected. We love you, church. We pray that you have an awesome and amazing day. 
And remember this, if God is for you, then there is no one who can come against you. Have a wonderful day, church. God bless you.